Corporate Finance Core, Topic 2, Learning Objective Number 4. We're going to understand and forecast free cash flows. Now let's talk about cash flows versus profits. The ultimate goal of a business is to generate cash for its owners. Now, cash is not the same as accounting profits because of non-cash revenues and expenses, working capital, and capex. So when we talk about free cash flows, it's a term for the, the firm's cash after these adjustments to profit, after adjustments uh, for non-cash revenues, expenses, uh, working capital, and capex. However, there are two types of free cash flows. They're called free cash flows to the firm, FCFF, or also called, that's also called unlevered free cash flows. And free cash flows to equity, FCFE, another name for that is levered free cash flows. When we talk about levered and unlevered, levered means with debt, unlevered means without debt. So an unlevered uh, cash flow would be the cash flow if the firm had no debt, and levered accounts for the fact that the firm has debt. So uh, again, let's talk a little more about this free cash flow concept. The free cash flows to the firm are one of the most important measures for a business. It's the cash flows generated by a firm if it was unlevered, zero debt. Another way of thinking about it, it's also the cash flows the firm is generating before it pays interest and dividends. So it's actually the amount of money that's available to pay your debt and equity holders. Now, FCFF allows investors to evaluate a business's ability to generate cash from its operations. So forget about the debt. Are you able to generate uh, 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 cash flows from your operations, which also accounts for the fact you may need capex and working capital. So the calcul calculation for these free cash flows to the firm, I'm gonna take my EBIT, earnings before interest and tax. Again, no interest, no tax. I'm then going to take out taxes by multiplying the EBIT times one minus the tax rate. That is going to give me my after tax operating profit. So you can think about this as operating profit. And by taking one minus the tax rate, you now have net operating profit after tax. Let me erase that. So this is operating profit after tax. Since EBIT includes depreciation, and, e and depreciation is a non-cash expense, right? It's a, it's a non-cash expense in EBIT. I'm going to add it back to try to get to cash flow. Also, since uh, the company may have spent some CapEx in that period, and CapEx is not fully in this EBIT number, only the depreciation part would be in, I'm going to subtract CapEx because that's actually going to cost the, the, the business money, cash. So I'm going to take my... Uh, net, net operating profit after tax, my EBIT after tax, add back depreciation because it's a non-cash expense and subtract CapEx because that is a cash uh, outlay that's not included in net income. And then I'm going to subtract any changes in net working capital. Now, net working capital, what we're talking about generally is cash plus accounts receivable plus inventory minus accounts payable. So it's those short-term assets and liabilities, and sometimes you'll throw in the other current assets and other current liabilities, uh, but not debt, okay? Don't throw debt in there. Um, so this is going to be, I'm gonna subtract any changes in networking capital to, to try to figure out how much cash the business is generating. And the reason why I need to make this last adjustment, adjustment is just think about accounts receivable. Maybe you have sales to get, you know, some sales that generate that EBIT, you never received the cash floor. So I'm gonna subtract the increase in accounts receivable because I never received the cash. And if I had to build up my inventory, you know, you know, uh, maybe I have more shelves to fill to try to entice uh, uh, buyers to buy my goods, that costs me cash, but increasing an in inventory, increases in inventory, even though it costs me cash, it's not an EBIT. So I need to, to, to sub, uh, subtract that value. Um, and then, I'm sorry, I changed the sign of that. Let me flip that. I'm going to subtract changes in accounts receivable. I'm going to subtract inventory. I'm going to add changes in accounts and payable. The reason why I add changes uh, in, in accounts payable is uh, is if I got if if I bought some goods to generate this profit, but I never paid for it, I need to add that back. So let me just be very clear. Let's let's take the signs out again. 
net working capital, net working capital is cash plus accounts receivable plus inventory minus accounts payable. But since I'm subtracting the change in net working capital, effectively, I'm subtracting increases in accounts receivable, I'm subtracting increases in inventory, and I'm adding increases in accounts payable to get at my level of cash that business is generating. Now, networking capital always excludes debt and bank loans. And then the only one that gets really interesting is this number here. Sometimes we include cash and networking capital, and sometimes we don't. So let's talk about that. Uh, well, let's talk about why a company even holds cash. So here are four reasons why a company would hold cash. The first one would be a, tr a traditional notion of a kind of a retail business. Uh, if you need cash in the cash registers to just generate your, your business to, to, for operations, uh, then that cash is considered working capital. Also, if you just kind of on, on a daily basis, you have you're paying bills and you're receiving cash, you just need to keep a balance there like you might just do in your home checking account. You know, you don't have too much in there because you're not really getting much interest, but you want to just make sure that you have enough cash to handle your, your ins and outs. You know, so these transactional cash balances, if they're really needed just to run the business, I would include, or we, I will always include that in working capital. However, uh, what if you're just holding cash because you know, uh, it's kind of a rainy day fund. I have an extra uh, million dollars in cash in case it's a downturn. Well, I can consider that uh, maybe it's, it's not required for the business, it's kind of excess cash. Or maybe I'm trying to avoid taxes uh, on foreign operations. Uh, we call it repatriation tax avoidance, even though that's largely gone away with the new tax laws uh, uh, at last in 2019. However, if you're just kind of holding the cash out there because uh, you don't want to pay taxes and kind of waiting for uh, a better time to do it or, or use that money later uh, versus bringing it home and being taxed, you know, that, that might be a reason to hold cash, but that's not really working capital. And then the last one, a minor point, sometimes uh, when you borrow money, the bank will ask you to deposit cash in, that, in their bank. It's, it's called a, a compensating balance. So these are reasons why a company may hold cash. It's just a rainy day fund, or you're just holding off and holding cash because you may need it someday. You don't want to borrow money later. So for all these reasons, companies may hold cash. So when I consider cash in working capital, I'm really considering it as just a, a need to run the business. And here's an example. Um, at this On this year, and I think still currently, Apple has uh, about 150 to $200 billion in cash on hand. Now, you would think they don't need uh, $200 billion of cash on hand to, in the cash registers at the Apple stores. So what are they doing? The whole, Why are they holding it? Well, no one really knows, but uh, it's probably related to holding cash for future growth, uh, future CapEx, or trying to avoid some taxes. So for whatever reason, they're holding cash. And just for fun, by the way, uh, the amount of cash that Apple had in 2015 was about the amount of currency reserves by the country of Mexico in 2017. So by using non-cash working capital, so, so if I exclude cash from working capital, I'll call it non-cash working capital. If I exclude cash from working capital, I'm assuming cash is really used for other reasons and not just needed to run the business. So let's talk about the calculation of the FCFF, the free cash flows of the firm, that unlevered cash flow. Again, it's my EBIT after tax, add back depreciation, subtract CapEx, and then subtract changes in net working capital. The second cash flow measure I want to talk about is FCFE. Free cash flows to equity, free cash flows to the shareholder. Instead of tar starting with EBIT after tax, I'll start with net income. I'll make those same adjustments, depreciation, CapEx, and net working capital. All right, so it's net income has, and then what's the only difference there? The only difference is interest expense. So you've already paid off your bondholders, uh, you know, the interest uh, obligations. And so this is the money so far left over for shareholders after the debt after the interest has been paid 
but we're going to add two more items. If the company issued more debt, that's going to generate cash flows for equity holders. And if they paid off debt, they paid off a loan, that's going to cost the equity holders cash. So, uh, you know, so think about, uh, you know, when you go ahead and borrow money from the bank, you put that cash in your account, that's available for you to use. And if you make, a, say, an extra, uh, say, mortgage payment, you pay an extra mortgage payment to pay down your debt in any given month, you are reducing your cash. So free cash flows to equity are, are cash flows uh, uh, available to equity holders, shareholders, which accounts for interest expense, working capital, and any issuance or retirement or payoff of debt. So let's do two little exercises. Exercise one, we're gonna calculate free cash flows to the firm and free cash flows to equity. And then we'll do another one, uh, similar exercise. So I'm gonna to go to my spreadsheet. I'm gonna to go to FCF and do the first exercise. So that what we're gonna to try to calculate is free cash flows to the firm in 2019 and here are my financials. So I'm gonna start with EBIT, sales, minus cost of goods sold minus SG&A minus depreciation is EBIT. I'm then going to subtract taxes. Well, what are taxes? Uh, I'm going to assume a tax rate of 25% times my 400. That's $100 in taxes. I'll then take my EBIT. I'll add that negative tax number. So I have my EBIT after tax of 300. Now I need to subtract CapEx. One way of getting CapEx, uh, luckily I have a financial statement here that's been forecasted for you. I have fixed assets at cost gone from 750 to 950. What that means is it looks like I purchased another $200 of fixed assets. So I'm gonna subtract that $200 because that must've been my CapEx. I'm forecasting fixed assets at cost increased by 200. I'm gonna add back depreciation. Depreciation is right here. And then I wanna subtract any changes in net working capital. Let's assume that cash is included in working capital. So if I look at cash plus receivables plus inventory minus accounts payable in 2018, that number is 225. If that in 2019, add those accounts together again, and that's 278. So the free cap, I'm sorry, the working capital increased by 53. I'm going to subtract that increase. And then I'm going to sum up everything from EBIT after tax in those three line items. So this company is generating $172 of free cash flows, assuming no debt. Payment, so it's available to pay interest, pay down debt. Um, so that's that's my free cash flows of the firm. Now let's go ahead and get the net uh, free cash flows to equity. So it's very similar, except we're going to start with net income. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my I'm going to open a open a bracket there. Sales minus cost of goods sold minus SG&A minus depreciation minus interest. I'm gonna then multiply that times one minus my tax rate. So my net income is 296. I'm then gonna make those same three adjustments, subtract CapEx, add back depreciation, subtract changes in net working capital. And then the last thing, if you look at the balance sheet, I'm forecasting debt to go to 100 to 150, an increase of 50. So I must have issued an extra $50 of debt. That's gonna actually generate cash for the equity holder. So free cash flows to equity is 218. And I can just uh, complete a couple line items here. Accumulated depreciation. In 2018, if depreciation was 200, and in 2019, depreciation is 125, that must mean the accumulated depreciation must be 325. And retained earnings, well, I guess I need to put my net income in here, so let's do that. Let's take sales minus cost of goods sold minus SG&A minus depreciation minus interest times one minus my tax rate. 
There's my net income in 2018, 2019. That's the same as this number here. So what is retained earnings in 2019? It's going to be that net income times one minus the payout. So I need 60% of that net income is retained and I get 178, whoops, <laughs> plus my prior value. So it's 375 plus the 178. So 553 and there we go. So there's our assets and liabilities and everything looks good. Now let's do one extra exercise before we finish up this topic. Exercise two. So I'm going to go to FCFF forecast. And this is a little shorter forecast. I'm going to forecast FCFF based on these assumptions. So I'm looking for year one. T equals one. And this is T equals zero. So this would be, say, last year. So revenue in year T equal one is last year's times my forecasted growth rate of sales. So I'm forecasting revenue or sales of 600. I'm gonna make an assumption that SG&A and cost of goods sold combined as a percentage of sales is 40%. So I'll just take 40% of revenue. Depreciation is 10% of sales. That's another way of you can say a historical relationship. That gives me EBIT of revenue minus my operational expense, 300. Taxes, 300 times the tax rate of 25%. That gives me my EBIT after tax of 225. See how I'm doing so far. Now I need to add back depreciation. I need to subtract CapEx. Now CapEx, the assumption here, it's 20% of sales in any given year. So it's another way of getting CapEx. So I'm going to make that a negative here minus 20% of that year's sales. So there might be a historical relationship between increases or levels of sales and CapEx. And then networking capital. Notice here I have networking capital. I'm gonna assume that networking capital is 15% is of sales. So it, last year it was $75. This year, if that 15% holds times $600, my increase in networking capital is $15. So I'm going to subtract that increase in networking capital. And then I'm going to add up everything from EBIT after tax. And I get $150 as the free cash flows to the firm. So there we go. Did a little exercise of calculating free cash flows to the firm. And this topic, we tried to understand and forecast free cash flows and try to think about why they're so important. So let's talk about, for another, another minute, let's talk about free cash flows. If I own the business, I care about how much money gets in my pocket every year. Profit is not how much money goes in my po pocket. Free cash flows are. If I had no debt, the free FCFF is how much money would go into my po pocket or it was how much money I could use to, say, pay off interest if I had it and pay down debt. Free cash flows to equity accounts for the fact that we have debt and that is literally how much money is available for the shareholder if, you know, assuming they made their interest payments and maybe had some debt issuance. So FCFE is literally, so you can think about it as kind of the maximum dividend you could have paid yourself in any given year. And last topic, we're just gonna create a data table in Excel because it's a very valuable tool.